Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming out on a rainy Tuesday. Um, we're glad to see you. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here at Connecticut's Old State House. And thankfully, after a very long winter, it's now time to think spring. And today's program on urban gardens will get us all in the mood for spring and summer and enjoying warm weather. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you of some of the fun things coming up in the warmer weather here at the Old State House. On Tuesday, June the 16th, make sure to come back for a program, a conversation with Helen Higgins, Preservation Powerhouse. And that's gonna be our conversation at noon. It starts at noon. Also on the 16th, is, that is the start of our farmer's market, which will be held Tuesday and Friday from June the 16th all the way through October. So we hope you'll join us for that. On um, June the 26th, which is a Friday, uh, it will be the first of our concert series that takes place over the summer. And Tom Callanan, who is a former state troubadour, will be with us that day. Check out our other Friday concerts as well. And um, I just wanted to remind you, please, we do read your surveys. We are looking for new ideas, so please make sure to fill it out and hand it to one of the staff members before you leave. And with that, I don't want to hold up the program. I know everyone's eager to think spring and think gardens. So it's my pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague and friend, Diane Smith, who is the senior producer for program development at the Connecticut Network. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Well, I want to say thank you to um, those of you that were able to brave the construction and the rain and the wet concrete outside and find your way into the old state house. We appreciate it. And if you can let um, your friends and, and other gardening aficionados know that this program is going to be airing on CTN and it will also be available on demand. Uh, you can watch it on ct -n com. So a couple of places to see it. So let's get started. Um, since our topic today is the greening of Hartford, I thought I'd start by reading an excerpt from the Bushnell Park website, and it goes like this. In 1853, recognizing the need for open space in Hartford, the Reverend Horace Bushnell presented an idea that had not been suggested in any other American city, the creation of a public park financed by public funds. Initial public reaction was skeptical. Hard-nosed business leaders were opposed to removing taxable property from the tax rolls. Furthermore, it was hard to imagine a less likely place for a green, peaceful park than Bushnell's proposed site, which was home to two leather tanneries, a soap works, pig styes, even a garbage dump. A railroad spur ran through it, and then there was the smelly Park River, which was polluted not only by the city's industrial uh, sites, but also um, it ran alongside tenements that were on both sides of the river using porta potties that emptied directly into the river. Even Reverend Bushnell, when he named the site, called it hell without fire. But as we know, Bushnell prevailed, took a few years, but in what was a national first and the first scale, first really large scale project to help green the city, he did get Bushnell Park built eventually. But creating gardens and green spaces in Hartford is about more than beautifying our city. Urban gardening and landscaping affects our quality of life in a multitude of ways. Today's speaker, Jack Hale, can tell us a lot about community greening in Hartford because he has long been a moving force behind it, beginning with community and school gardening and expanding into neighborhood tree planting, volunteer landscaping projects, and Youth Corps job development. Jack spent 25 years as the executive director of the Knox Parks Foundation, developing and guiding those programs and others. Jack was recently elected chair of the new Hartford Tree Advisory Commission and remains active in community gardening and other community greening activities. So please welcome Jack Hale. So, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I get to talk about uh, one of my favorite subjects. They just asked me to speak for 20 minutes, though, and that's ridiculous uh, <laughs> for me. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to be good. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to talk about, and I'll, I'll just uh, move through it uh, as best I can. Got a few uh, interesting pictures for you to look at and uh, 
Uh, they'll help illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, Diane's introduction was a pretty good start on things because Greening of Hartford started with wealth, uh, which we don't really have now. Uh, uh, but back in the 1800s, uh, wealthy people were the folks who were in a, in a position to create green oases. So this, uh, I don't know whether you can see it at this, at this scale, but that is 1877 Coltsville. Uh, basically Elizabeth Colt's backyard um, with arms mirror up in the right hand corner and the Church of Good Shepherd in the lower lower right uh, and the, the the factory you can't see it's just below there but that, that was her grounds little little backyard uh, but uh, you see that uh, that sort of rectangular open rectangle in the just below the center of the, uh, uh, of the image, that's a greenhouse, 2,300 linear feet. Uh, a little bigger than yours, Ron? <laughs> anyway, she grew her own, she didn't grow her own. She had, her people <laughs> grew all kinds of food in there. Uh, and up in the upper, around the, the grounds of the house itself, there were, statuary and ponds and geese and or swans and a deer park and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, and it turns out she wasn't the only one in town who was doing some of that kind of stuff. Uh, I happened across a news article from back in those days that talked about all the different uh, uh, estates that had uh, extensive greenhouses on them. So that was, that was going on. But we come to the end of the 1800s, and uh, several of the, of the folks, including Elizabeth Colt, uh, were prepared to give their land for, uh, for parks for the city. So here's a, a really cool image of the children's garden that was in Colt Park once, once that park was established. She left her entire grounds, except for the immediate area right around the house, to the city to form Colt Park. And the children's garden, which uh, was right next to Stonington Street, it was, a, was a component of it. And then uh, Charles Pond uh, gave his land for Elizabeth Park, and we got that out of it. Uh, the, the wealth behind that is, uh, is just stunning to me, the personal wealth. So moving right along to the mid-60s, this is Betty Knox. Uh, and uh, she had some personal wealth. Her father was R.C. Knox, the insurance guy. Uh, and she was free to spend her life on civic uh, uh, ventures because of the wealth of her family. And uh, just before she died in 1966, she had created a fund uh, to improve life in the city. Uh, and uh, she had uh, three buddies she got together. Uh, Sam Fuller, who was a banker across the street here. Uh, Mary Edwards, who was the first uh, uh, female landscape architect in Connecticut. Uh, and Jack Riga, who uh, is a lawyer, founder of the firm of Reed and Riga, which is still a pretty big deal here in town. Um, at any rate, she set up this fund that she and her friends were going to use to uh, make little grants. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, she died. So Sam and Jack and Mary were left as the trustees of the Knox Foundation. And the, uh, the, uh, that foundation operated as a single entity for about 12 years after that. Um, and uh, there's Jack Dollard. He was the, the uh, executive director of the foundation early years. He's no longer with us, but uh, he was a larger than life figure here in Hartford. And during his, his time with the foundation, uh, they put the carousel in Bushnell Park. They had the amazing uh, 
arts programs. Peace Train was funded by the Knox Foundation. Uh, if you remember, Thursday is a work of art. Remember that downtown activity. They also did a lot of other more development-oriented projects, largely in the downtown, but they created a food co-op in, uh, in uh, uh, Sand, public, ha uh, public housing development up, up uh, in North Hartford, uh, and a bunch of other things like that as well. But they also got involved in some uh, greening programs, horticultural programs of one kind or another, Another fellow, I don't, it's really hard finding images of all these folks, but John Alexopoulos, uh, who is now uh, just wrapping up his career as a, a professor of landscape architecture at UConn, uh, was involved in, in early horticultural activities. Uh, oh yeah, there, I have to show you that little image of the carousel there to illustrate that the early work of the Knox Foundation. Um, and that thing is still going strong. What a great, great asset for the city that is. Now here's Jack Riga. It, it's for a guy that had his finger in so many pies in this city and still does, finding a picture of him was really impossible. Uh, and this, this one is a really terrible picture, but, but uh, there he is at an event uh, the Hartford Foundation put on at the Pond House in Elizabeth Park. He was, he was not only the trustee for the Knox Foundation, but he was on the board of a little company in, uh, in uh, Albany, Troy. Troy built. You ever heard of that? They had set up a a separate entity called Gardens for All. It was a corporate scam, sort of like. They had the idea that if they encouraged people to do more gardening, they could sell more of those. Uh, and I guess they were right, uh, because really a huge movement got started out of that. The, the uh, new wave community garden movement in the United States really came out of the efforts of Gardens for All to promote that, along with some other things like Organic Gardening Magazine, uh, Robert Rodale and, and some of those folks. But Jack was on the, on the board of Gardens for All and got this idea of community gardens and brought it back to the Knox Foundation and said, we should do that here in Hartford. So the first community garden in Hartford was started in 1972. That, if you're familiar with Keeney Park and the stables for the uh, mounted police, it was right, in, right there was where the first community garden was. I verified that with John Alexopoulos just a couple weeks ago because um, I had never really known quite where it was. I knew it was in Keeney Park, but he told me that's where it was. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really have time to... Uh, get an image of that location, but, but uh, that's where it is. And out of that grew a whole, uh, whole bunch of community gardens. Here's one of them, uh, a great guy, uh, Arthur King there in his, in his plot. I think that's at the Watkinson Community Garden out behind the Unitarian Meeting House on Bloomfield Avenue. But these gardens got started uh, at that time and, and continue to grow moving forward. Now, there, there came to be, at that point, some real stress between the downtown development activity of the Knox Foundation and the horticultural activities that were going on. Uh, I guess the people who were on the board just felt like they were always trying to sort out the, what they were doing at that time, and what would the priorities were and such. So in 1976, 77, the, um, the foundation split into two. So there was the Knox Foundation, or the Knox Downtown Foundation, as it came to be referred to, and then the Knox Parks Foundation. Uh, so the Downtown Foundation carried on a community development grant-making activity, which it carries on to this day, and the Knox Parks Foundation took on the horticultural side of things. Shortly, well, 
now that there were two organizations and one of them had staff that was doing in the dirt all the time, uh, they needed a place to go. So uh, that's where they went. In 1978, Knox Parks Foundation moved into the caretaker's cottage in Elizabeth Park. That's not a photo, that's a painting that one of my, uh, one of the former board members of, uh, of the Knox Parks Foundation uh, painted for us and I got it at, a, at an auction. <laughs> um, anyway, at that point, there was another, another person was the director, Mike Marchetti, who is no longer around here. He's, he launched off to Maine or someplace shortly thereafter. Uh, but he, he kind of got things established over in Elizabeth Park. Uh, created no end of confusion because people thought that Knox was actually taking care of Elizabeth Park and there was all stress between Knox and the city staff and the friends of Elizabeth Park and that went on for a long time. But uh, really Knox was involved at that point in community gardens and school garden programs, a uh, number of things like that. In 1978, Jill Barrett, that's not Jill Barrett, that's a garden. Uh, I couldn't get a picture of her either, but Jill Barrett, who is, is still an active person around town involved in community development work, uh, she became the director of Knox at the Knox Parks Foundation at that point. And the community gardens uh, under her leadership grew to be 22, I think was the, the peak number at, at that time. Community gardens were originally established in a lot of ways, or a lot of, uh, in, the, in some terms, as a way to use unused land. Uh, in, the, in the 80s, Hartford had a lot of vacant property. Um, and so the community gardens were used as a way to have something going on on that property. And a lot of mistakes were made at that point. Uh, putting gardens in places that really weren't good places for gardens and, <laughs> and uh, setting them up in ways that were not really that usable for, for some of the folks. So we got, we got educated over the years. Um, but uh, that, this, is, this is my garden. This is where I have a, have a plot. That's uh, at the Church of Good Shepherd in Coltsville. Uh, nice, nice backdrop for the, your carrots. Um, but uh, it's one of the few gardens in the city that's actually on real soil. Most of the gardens were built on former building sites. Uh, so uh, th this one's pretty good. You can actually, you can really grow things there. Um, what, what came, well, what, what came along was that other gardens, this is the Nile Street Garden, that's Mike McGarry's garden. Uh, that's not Mike. Mike's, that's Mike right there. Uh, <laughs> can't get a picture of you anywhere either. Man, Google and you is nuts. But, uh, but uh, uh, great garden over on Nile Street. This was uh, actually donated to Knox by Aetna. The land was. Uh, at that point, it was the only, is it still the only garden that's owned by Knox? Or do you own? You own Earl Street too? Which one? Sergeant Street. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, Andrew donated that. Uh, so we, we had always had the, a strategy of not owning things. Owning things is a real pain in the neck. Uh, but a few did come into possession of, of Knox, and there are some advantages to that. Now, at the time this was going on, uh, a national movement was really coalescing. So Gardens for All got things started in the early 70s, but by the late 70s, uh, nationwide, people were starting to develop community gardens all over the place. Hartford was not only cutting edge with Bushnell Park, but it was also cutting edge with, with its community gardens program. There were really a relatively small number of cities that had a going program. There were little gardens here and there, um, but, uh, you know, you went to Boston and New York and Philadelphia and uh, Chicago and a few other cities that were really starting to get it going. And it, 
and by the late 70s, people were saying, you know, we ought to have a way to collaborate. So folks created the American Community Gardening Association, which continues as the main glue for the community gardening movement in, the, in, this, in North America. It's, it's US and Canada. Um, a really great organization. They're having a conference in Denver in, in August, if you want to go. Uh, uh, it's worth a trip. Um, at any rate, that, uh, Jill Barrett was part of the group that started the American Community Gardening Association, and that made a big difference. But what we learned, well, let me, point, let me mention one other thing. This is a grow lab. We, we started the grow lab program in Hartford in 1980. I was actually hired by Knox to set up a school gardening program and developed a, ver a, a, more, a cruder version of that technology. It allowed for school children to grow crops to maturity in their classroom. It had so much light in there that it wasn't just for starting seedlings. You could grow tomatoes in, in there and carrots and such. Um, the National Gardening Association ad adopted that as a project to um, uh, disseminate. They had funding from the National Science Foundation to spread this to classrooms all over the country, and they did it. We, I worked with them to write a handbook for it, and, and uh, they created a cr science curriculum, and they made the, this, uh, they designed this fancy equipment. Uh, and made it available through a catalog, and they are everywhere. I tell you, I go to any city and people know what a grow lab is. It's, uh, it's a matter of some pride for me. Um, but I, in the meantime, community gardens were continuing on. This is another shot at the Watkinson Garden. Uh, and here's their, the newest, newest Knox Garden on Earl Street uh, with Charmaine Craig in the background who's been a real spark plug of the whole thing in the last, uh, the last uh, how long, 15 years? Something like that? 12. 12, yeah. Amazing, amazing woman in the work she's done. Um, what we learned with community gardens and with school gardens and, and other projects we got involved in is that people wanted to do stuff. And this was a real change from, you know, I talked early on that wealth was where, where this all started. Where things are based now is on people's interests and willingness to do stuff. Uh, whether it's to have their own community garden or to help other folks develop community gardens or, or uh, the school gardening program was amazing. We had teachers in every school in the city who were, who were doing gardening with their kids back in the 80s. Um, but, uh, but, but things moved along beyond that. What happened in, in uh, 1997 was the development of the Hartford Blooms program. It was a collaboration between Knox and a, a group called Hartford Proud and Beautiful that was supported by the Downtown Council. It was really the idea of Mike McGarry, uh, supported by Mayor Peters. And the idea was to really beautify the city. Uh, in order to handle that, Knox moved into this location on Laurel Street where it is today. I love this picture. It's kind of fuzzy, but it's a, and the aerial view is really cool of that, uh, that space. And here's what the, the Hartford Blooms program looks like getting started. This is a pretty old picture, but uh, really getting flowers out onto the streets. Uh, but the use of volunteers there was really key. But then came AmeriCorps, the development of the Green Crew, which was a, a youth corps uh, capable of supporting not only the Hartford Blooms program, but other greening programs around the city. We found that not only could we get people from the city to do this kind of work, but I, I, I was telling Ron just the other day, when, hanging out with, with some of the folks on, on the green crew. These folks are fired up. These are urban residents, unemployed, looking for something to do, and they get into this, this green industry, and they just, they get, they're smiling, they're proud, they're getting work done. 
Uh, they're a tremendous asset to the city. And uh, here, here is an early class graduating from a year of training with the, with the Green Crew. The mayor's presenting a certificate to them. And it, Mayor Segarra has been a tremendous supporter of, of all of this, all of the work that Knox has been doing, that other people have been doing in the city. And finally, built on, built on that, ex, the, this whole experience is another program called Trees for Hartford Neighborhoods. It's a way to bring trees into neighborhoods, but not just go and plunk them down, but to engage the residents and other volunteers in the planting and the care for those trees. And the result is a program that has like, I don't know, 80, 90% survival rate, which is, is really, really awesome. And they've planted, Ron can tell you more specifically, but they planted thousands of trees this way. Uh, and you've got a green crew member. Here's Ron in the hole as usual. Uh, and there, there's actually a picture of Mike McGarry right there. He's in the back in that reddish shirt. But, but uh, uh, folks get really engaged in this kind of activity, and it's it's a wonderful asset for the for the city. And building on that, we also created the Greater Hartford Green Team. This was a way for neighborhood residents and other volunteers who wanted to do something for the city to get involved in specific projects where they could make a difference and where they could work with other folks from their neighborhood and from throughout the city and even wider uh, to, uh, to get involved in these projects. And we, you know, this is a brilliant idea. Let's see if this works. Well, it actually worked. You know, people still, once a month, come out by the dozens to engage in all kinds of different projects, whether it's tree planting or seedlings for Hartford Blooms or, or uh, any of those kinds of things. Uh, it, it's, it's really demonstrated that they can, they can do that. Just one more second. I'm just about uh, wrapping up. It, it, one of the great things about the, the green team is that it engages kids. You don't have to be any particular age or skill or anything else to be involved in that. If you want to help plant a tree, you can do it. And here, these are some crazy people in the West End one time doing a tree. That was, that was, that was an absolutely revolutionary day on, on Beacon, I think it was Beacon Street, right? Or Oxford or one, one of those ones. Everybody was out there. It was just great. And people afterwards said, this is the first time I've met the folks from uh, down the street. We're, we're into this. We're going to be partying and carrying on. Um, and, uh, and speaking of party, the, the Green Crew events always have some kind of music and food. And it's, it's, a, it's a real party. And out of this has come the Tree Crew. The, these are some of those young people who are so involved in this, they become specialized just in the tree side of the game. And you can tell, those guys are happy to be doing that. And uh, out of that further is training for residents. The tree tenders program is, uh, is coming along now. Now I'll just shut up because I've run out of time and I've run out of slides and we can move on from there. Thank you. Can Ron come on up and join us and have a little discussion? Um, for those of you that might have a comment or a question, Chris has a uh, microphone in his back pocket. So if you raise your hand and get my attention, I'll call on you and he'll come over with the microphone. Um, and if you'll wait for him to come over, that makes it better for the television program that we're recording right now. So um, you probably already know who these people are because uh, Jack kindly referred to them a number of times, but joining us now are Ron Pitts. Uh, he's sitting in the center. Uh, Ron sort of took up where Jack Hale left off as the executive director of Knox Incorporated, as it's now known. Um, Ron is a Yukon master gardener, among other things, as well as a master wildlife conservationist. He's also a member of the City Tree Protective Society and a member of the Connecticut Urban Tree Council, things that I'm happy just to hear exist. 
um, really great. Mike McGarry uh, served on the Hartford City Council for three terms, and uh, he really encouraged the start of Hartford Blooms after a tour of Ireland with Mayor Mike Peters, and we'll go into that in a little bit more. Um, today he coordinates Hartford Blooms garden tours and serves on several city boards, but his real love is the community garden that you pointed out, Jack, uh, his garden on Nile Street. Um, Mike, we're going to start with you because you have a great event that's coming up. It starts June 6th. Um, it's the Hartford Blooms Garden and Architecture Tour. And before you talk about it, let's share a little bit of the video that you brought, okay? Okay, so while Rebecca gets the video queued up, actually, I'll let you talk a little bit about the, the garden tour because this goes on for over a week and it's opportunity to see what? It's a weekend, a week and a weekend. Mm -hmm. Gardens all over the city, mm -hmm. including the Knox headquarters and across the street Park Place Towers. And wonderfully this year, the Colt Building. People say, Colts, what's that got to do with gardens? Mm -hmm. Well, the horticultural background, as you saw from the picture of the Colts, to many people, just as important. Oh, we got our video. Here we go. You know, when you see it all together there in a video like that, you see all the many sites that are involved. Um, it really is a little bit overwhelming. It's just gorgeous. Well, there's so much to see in Hartford. People don't realize. By the way, that was P.V. O'Donnell, that music. Mm -hmm. P.V. is my great friend, recently deceased, sad to say. Mm -hmm. We went to Ireland together, but I'll give you a piece of advice. It is dangerous to go to Ireland with a fiddler. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> well, we have gardens all over the place, yeah. and it's quite the best thing for people to do is go on our website, mm -hmm. hartfordblooms.org, mm -hmm. or if they want to show this to a friend, mm -hmm. it's on YouTube, mm -hmm. Hartford Blooms, Hartford Blooms promo video. Mm -hmm. What else would it be? Okay, and so um, you were just starting to say before the video ran that among the places that are included on the tour this year are Coltsville and, yeah. and, and the, that very iconic building, the Colt building. I just had uh, 40 people from Toronto of Caribbean descent. Mm -hmm. a Saturday, I took them up to the Colts building and gave them kind of the lecture, pointing out where all this was, Potsdam Village, where the greenhouses were and all that. One lady said, guns, guns, I'm nothing to do with guns. I said, look, don't worry about that part of it. That's not what we're here for. 
We got up into Chef Harry's room and explained the whole industrial system mm -hmm. that Kolda put together, which, as Jack mentioned, really was hard culture. Mm -hmm. That was, at the time, from what I read, and Hosley tells me, Bill Hosley, who's really the expert on this, they were just as well known for that stuff mm -hmm. as they were for the guns. Interesting. And few people in Hartford know that, but that's one of the reasons we're doing it for nine days, two hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, two to four, every day for nine mm -hmm. days from the 6th to the 14th. Great. Saturday, Sunday, all week, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, terrific. Um, Ron, let me get you involved here because um, as Jack was discussing uh, what's now called Knox Inc., uh, I kept thinking about something that is really our mission here at the Old State House, which is civic engagement. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the more he talked about the programs that you now supervise and administer and, and promote, uh, the more I thought about civic engagement on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. So why don't you address that a little bit? Well, civic engagement is probably the most important piece of what we do. We mm -hmm. don't do anything without buy-in from the community mm -hmm. and, and, and involvement from them. Mm -hmm. uh, we feel that if, if the community is involved, then they get to feel that they're part of the positive change. Mm -hmm. and, and there's ownership. So when you're planting trees with the community, um, uh, Jack mentioned we have a, a nearly, well, it's like a 97, 98% success rate with the wow. trees that we plant. That means three out of every hundred don't make it. Mm -hmm. That's a huge success rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you it's attribute way, that to what, Ron? We attribute that to community involvement. Mm -hmm. If we involve the neighborhood or the, mm -hmm. the local community in, in the area that we're planting the trees, um, just to, for an example, if, if we were planting a tree in front of your home mm -hmm. and you actually came out and helped us uh, dig the hole, mm -hmm. um, you would make sure that that tree survived. Yeah. So that's the idea behind it. Um, not only are you uh, more energized and you have more civic pride because mm -hmm. you've beautified your neighborhood, but you're going to make sure that that tree lives. If mm -hmm. it needs water, you're going to water it or you'll call us. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea behind mm -hmm. it. The same thing with uh, community gardens. Mm -hmm. We're back up to 22 gardens, as mm -hmm. Jack said, that was the peak uh, uh, back in the day. And We're how much produce up. gets produced in a season? Nearly 80 tons. 80 tons. 80 tons. Okay. Is that all taken home by the gardeners, or does that some of that go elsewhere? No, a lot of that actually ends up uh, with food share or, or being donated, and, and actually some of it um, is sold by our gardeners. Mm -hmm. we, we do uh, encourage some uh, micro business mm -hmm. uh, enterprises that come That's out great. of the garden. And, and we feel that these wonderful... Uh, uh, farmers markets that come mm -hmm. into the city mm -hmm. and it's amazing there's probably one a day mm -hmm. you know during the season um, but a lot of the produce is brought in from the suburbs mm -hmm. which is w wonderful mm -hmm. but there's some things Hartford uh, residents come from everywhere in the world so there's things uh, that aren't there but things that we find our gardeners grow so ethnic crops such mm -hmm. as uh, West Indian crops mm -hmm. uh, uh, People from Cuba, Hispanic, you know, different, they, they mm -hmm. like different things yeah. Uh, yeah. to eat from where they came from. So our gardeners are actually growing that produce. Mm -hmm. So we have a, um, a program that we just started with the Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. to encourage our gardeners to actually get those ethnic crops into the market. Yeah. So, yeah. so we see a lot of Hartford community mm -hmm. residents coming to the Mm -hmm. Farmers markets now to buy the things that they. Well, we'd love to get some of them to that, come here to the that old state house. They want to buy absolutely. Yeah. Um, Jack, tell me a little bit about um, your community garden and what sorts of folks are there and what they're growing and and, and is there a sense of um, camaraderie or do people go at different times and, and don't really get to see each other or how does it all work? Uh, our garden is about large enough so that you, when I, when I'm there, there's usually somebody else there. Mm -hmm. it, it's very we have to actually work at getting everybody there at one time because people have different schedules and different preferences and things like that. Uh, it's a wide range of people. We have people from Hartford, uh, people from some of the surrounding towns who have a reason to be in Hartford. They're a member, it's at the Church of Good Shepherd, the Colt Church, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there are several parishioners from the church who have, have plots there. Uh, very different ideas about what they ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one woman who's just crazy about growing stuff, and she pretty much gives everything away. Uh, just garden variety, garden stuff. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, a, I'm big on perennial things. I grow berries and asparagus and things like that. Um, there's a West Indian fellow who plants two entire plots with callaloo, mm -hmm. uh, the, the West Indian uh, pot herb. Um, another guy who only grows flowers, he didn't have time for this vegetable stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so it, it's, it's uh, once you've got some, some good soil to work with, and a level of security and some water, which is critical. Yes. Uh, you can, people just do, they, they express themselves mm -hmm. in that situation. And Ron was talking about the ethnic, different ethnic groups who mm -hmm. garden. My, one of my favorite things happened when uh, a group of refugees from Myanmar came to Hartford mm -hmm. with, with Catholic charities and they, they came to the Knox headquarters on Laurel Street uh, to have a garden. They're all farmers mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just needed a place to get in the dirt. Mm -hmm. But the people who were working with them didn't know what they wanted to grow and the, the, the translators couldn't, didn't even know the names of the foods, mm -hmm. the, the plants. So the, we brought the gardeners into the community greenhouse and they said, oh, that. That's what, uh -huh. you know, that's what we grow. It turned out that, some of, that uh, some of the West Indian gardeners were growing very similar crops to what the Burmese gardeners were, were familiar with. So they were able to actually uh, adopt uh, crops from other, from other areas for their purposes. Ron, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, something that Jack showed us, which um, was the green team. Um, I had a great experience with you. I came out one day when the green team was getting together and they were working outside of, I think it was a special housing project for yes. grandparents raising yep. their grandchildren. And um, they did all sorts of things, um, partly as a result of a gift from one person. Do you remember that story? I do, and I remember that day. That was an amazing day. Um, that was actually Generations, it's called, mm -hmm. that housing project with mm -hmm. CRT. And Knox does that a lot. We'll take our green team uh, membership mm -hmm. uh, and we'll leverage, you know, we'll, we'll start an event around that mm -hmm. and we have many more volunteers that mm -hmm. come in. I think that particular event had about 300 volunteers. And what I, what I loved about it, Ron, was that was um, huge event. people who might never have met each other otherwise came together because there were gardeners from the city, there were people who lived in that particular housing project and in the area right around it, because I think there was some gardening that went acro on across the street. Exactly. But then there were gardeners who came in from West Hartford and from Glastonbury and places, you know, a lot of suburban people who I thought they would never know these people. That's very true. And that's what we, that's what I love about it particularly because, and it's multi-generational. Mm -hmm. You can have, you know, a, a a three-year-old right. working with an octogenarian, right. you know, uh, uh, from, in fact, from that, that, um, that uh, housing complex. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, it, and, it, and we have green crew members, green crew members, mm -hmm. not green team, that's, mm -hmm. that's the AmeriCorps program. <laughs> right, right. And they're actually Hartford residents. Right. Um, and they have a much different background, mm -hmm. obviously, than someone who, who would come in from the mm -hmm. suburbs. Mm -hmm. And having them get to know each other is a wonderful thing to, to experience because they're Ameri both teaching yeah. each other. And, and how many of those AmeriCorps folks that you know, you're giving this experience to, how many of them have ever done any gardening before? Very few. Mm -hmm. And if they have, it's, it's with a grandparent or, or something like that. Uh, but, but yeah, very few. And, um, and even though the, the, it's based on horticulture, mm -hmm. Um, some people just don't have the aptitude mm -hmm. for that. So we, it's, it's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. With the green, cr uh, the green crew, um, they do a lot, of, a lot of work around the city, horticulturally mm -hmm. based, mm -hmm. but we also have a situation where we open a lot of doors for them as far mm -hmm. as other career counseling mm -hmm. type, uh, type activities. So um, many times uh, they don't know what's out there. Yeah. So there's a lot of edu there's a lot of 
assessment that happens as they come in. On and, and I do recall meeting some of the kids and, um, and having them say, you know, that some of the things that they had learned had nothing to do with horticulture. They That's learned true. what it's like to show up on time for a job, right. how you work as a team with other members of right. the team that you're assigned to work with, um, how you relate to your boss, you know, a lot sure. of other things that are transferable to other types of jobs. To be employable, yeah. that's what they need. I mean, we've had people uh, on an intake interview and their cell phone will ring and they'll actually take the call, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> as we're in an interview. And I'm like, no, that's the first lesson. You can't, we yeah. can't do that. But, yeah. but these are the kind of things that, you know, we think maybe would go without mm -hmm. saying, but, mm -hmm. but uh, you almost have to, to start from square yeah. A, you yeah. know, to teach those yeah. employability, uh, you know, and that's what traits. I think is such a strength about the program. I think we have a question right over here. Right, I have two, I have okay. two related questions. Uh, first off, is there a master plan for how you promote gardening throughout the city, um, or do you just sort of try to encourage any community to get started and, and go to support them? Uh, and the second question is, do you find yourself cultivating communities as well as you're cultivating gardens? A couple of great questions. I, Gardening is need-based, or community gardening is need-based. You, uh, you know the old saying, if you build it, they will come. It doesn't so much happen with community gardens. You need to, to get people together, and you need to gauge the interest in a certain community before you start the garden. Uh, the infrastructure for a community garden might not seem like that big of a deal, but it really is, because you can't garden without water, first of all. Uh, and, and some sort of a fence is, is uh, required, even though you, you uh, encourage community, to, community involvement and community. And the garden has to be porous to some degree, but the gardeners do a lot of work. Uh, and we have to try not to encourage people from the community to come in and just feel like they can help themselves, <laughs> um, which issue. some of them think that because oh community yeah. garden oh okay I'll, you know i need some tomatoes it's a nice tomato yeah. <laughs> but uh, so there's a lot of outreach and a lot of work with the immediate community that has to be done uh, so so no we don't go into a community and set up a garden and just say anybody want to have a garden <laughs> it's the other way around uh, because it's very expensive to set one up. Mike, uh, um, I want Mike and Ron and Jack to, what, is there a master plan for all of this that goes on around the city? Because when we looked at the video and we looked at your slides, there's so many pieces. Mm. Well, Jack and I talked years ago, when money was a little different, about a million dollars for 10,000 trees. Remember that, Jack? Mm -hmm. I was on the city council and I got involved in all this. Matter of fact, that little piece, nice sized piece of land frustrating because we had this greenhouse in another place that got knocked down. I decided to get on my bicycle, and this is a real master plan, get on the bike <laughs> and bike the town until I found a piece of land. Luckily, I turned right on Laurel. I found that piece of land, and after some negotiations, guess what? I had a piece of land. So I think it's a little more by happenstance rather than a plan because things change. You can decide a piece of land is perfect for a garden, and along will come economic development mm -hmm. and a housing project. Mm -hmm. So it, it shifts it all. You have to be very light on your feet in this business, I guess. Yeah, you do. Um, just like Harper Blooms. I mean, we, we may decide to do a tour somewhere, and all of a sudden, the people didn't have time to fix it up, and mm -hmm. we didn't scrub that one. But you know, you're light on your feet, and you take it with a little grain of salt, and that seems to work better out of the way than a real set plan. Mm -hmm. Real set plans, usually in this city, don't end up, in any city, end up the way they originally start. Yeah. But as far as gardening, yeah. too, uh, it's, a, it's, almost, it's need based mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, um, especially in areas they call food deserts, mm -hmm. which, uh, it, like in the Northeast neighborhood, right. is, is one. Well, there's a, for people that don't know that term, Right. means really a lack of fresh food in the neighborhood. Maybe exactly. they don't have a supermarket. They just have right. a, maybe just a small corner store that exactly. has mostly processed foods. Not lack a lot of, of access fresh. to yeah. fresh yeah. food, yep. basically. So, so, so one of our biggest gardens is actually in the Northeast neighborhood mm -hmm. at the corner of uh, Barber and, and Earl. Mm -hmm. Jack, I think you wanted to say something about that? Yep. Yeah, well, uh, quite a few years ago, we, we tried to do a little bit of... of strategic planning and what we did figure out is that probably a city this size could support about twice as many gardens as Knox has mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or had then uh, and the, the Earl Street Garden really added added to that 
Where the real planning is happening now is in urban forestry, in the, in the trees in the city, mm -hmm. uh, because there you can translate a, a need for more into specific action. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's currently a piece of work being done, a, 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 an assessment of the tree canopy in the city uh, that will identify areas that are ripe mm -hmm. for additional tree planting and, and where you would get mm -hmm. a significant impact. Right now, we've got about a 25% tree cover, and the estimate is that we could go to 35% mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the planting locations we have. Um, and so I, how to do that, that yeah. uh, we're really developing a plan for that, and that's something that will engage residents in the, in the planting just as they have been for the past mm -hmm. A uh, dozen years. My question about that, and, and maybe Ron, I'll address it to you. Are these um, areas that had been, uh, that did have trees, and those trees have either died off or have been, and you're replacing trees that once were there, or are you actually breaking into areas that did not have trees? And, you know, when you talk about the, the urban canopy, areas that maybe were not part of that? Um, I, I would say it's about 50 50. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in the downtown area, there's mm -hmm. only so many what we call tree wells or mm -hmm. tree pits. And um, a lot of times we're removing stumps, mm -hmm. you know, to plant new trees. So, and a lot of times the stumps have been there, have been cut for 20 years or really? more. You know, mm -hmm. it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what Jack was saying before is that, that um, or he didn't say exactly this, but he was alluding to it, is that a nonprofit steps up to, to, to fill a void. Mm -hmm. uh, and the city of Hartford has been amazing at their, their maintenance efforts on trees and tree mm -hmm. removal and tree pruning, but the void was there wasn't any comprehensive planting program. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're all working on at this point. And well, and, and when you talk about you know, how, the, how the city of Hartford has done on that, we all know that the city has had its financial challenges yes. and that in some cases just maintaining what's out there right. is difficult enough. One thing that um, I was looking on your website and that I found out um, Knox Inc. is involved with, I thought was really interesting, which is the restoration of Goodwin Park. Yes, we Talk are. Talk about that a little bit. Well, it's at the Goodwin Park Golf Course. Mm -hmm. um, there's a saga. Which I want to say I only know that it's in great shape because my husband recently started oh, playing there. Oh, awesome. He, said he, he couldn't great believe how, how good it was. Yeah. Great to hear it. Uh, so that just made my day. Well, you know, because he also, he also golfs in suburban areas, and, yeah. he's, and that's his favorite spot to go to is Goodwin. So. Well, there's a, there's a bit of a saga involved in that, in the Hartford golf courses. There's two major golf courses in the city. There are, there are two golf courses in the city of Hartford. One is in Keeney Park, mm -hmm. and one is in Goodwin Park. Mm -hmm. uh, the city had hired an outside contractor to take care of those two golf courses, mm -hmm. and they, well, let's just say they failed miserably. <laughs> So, now, so at this point, the city has, has kicked them out, mm -hmm. and now the city has uh, taken all kinds of safeguards to mm -hmm. protect these, these golf courses. Um, so both of them, Keeney Park was unplayable. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was let, it was neglected so badly. Mm -hmm. Goodwin was nearly unplayable, mm -hmm. but so uh, they hired some, new, actually with the help of the uh, Professional Golf Association of Connecticut, mm -hmm. They hired two new superintendents, mm -hmm. and um, those superintendents uh, then, with with an agreement through the city, uh, have hired eight um, of our Green Crew graduates mm -hmm. from Knox oh, great. to actually That's work great. with them yeah. to take care of it. Uh, That's terrific. And 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 you know your husband's comments, you know. It's a wonderful tribute to how great that program well, is working. And I, I really think so, because you know, if you're playing in a suburban location, particularly in some of the wealthier suburbs that we have in Connecticut, right. you expect a certain level of uh, maintenance on a, sure. on a public course. And to see it in the city instead is really, I, I think, really pretty So Keeney Golf, I just wanted to say, Keeney underwent a multi-million dollar restoration. Mm -hmm. And July 1st, mm -hmm. they'll be opening up the first nine holes. And, oh, that's good to know. And we have know. another eight Knox uh, Green Crew graduates going in to start at Keeney. So mm -hmm. we're very happy about mm -hmm. that. Mike, I wanted to ask you, um, Jack showed us Elizabeth Park. And it's, it's a so famous. People from all over the country know about Elizabeth Park, especially if there are people who are 
especially interested in roses. Um, but what about some of the hidden gems that people don't normally get to see that they could see on the Hartford Blooms tours? Yeah, right Just give me a right few. down the street here is St. Anthony St. Patrick's. Mm -hmm. They have, I have a tough time, how do you contemplate? How do you say contemplative. that? Contemplative. Contemplative garden, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right down the street here, just a block away next to the XL Center. Mm -hmm. And then Park Place Towers, right across the street from these guys, mm -hmm. is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Then the, the, there's gardens all over the city. Charter Oak Place, mm -hmm. uh, right up from where Jack's spot mm -hmm. is there. They have wonderful gardens. Mm -hmm. Now, Ashley Street is a real one. Ashley Street, I went to Buffalo a few years ago and saw what Buffalo did. You know they have the largest garden festival in the country? One of no the largest idea. in the world in Buffalo. When I think places. of Buffalo, I think snow and lots of bad weather. Well, <laughs> I don't think gardening. It, actually, the snow in Buffalo goes a little south. Buffalo uh -huh. gets a hit all the time. It's actually right below Buffalo. Mm -hmm. But Buffalo has a climate similar to ours mm -hmm. and the, the warmth from the water in the right time of year. And Buffalo has a wonderful program. They started with a couple of dozen people having open houses. Mm -hmm. Now they have thousands of gardens wow. available. And I went there and I picked that up. I went with, you heard the music P.B. O'Donnell, the Irish music mm -hmm. I'm into? We went there to do music for a play. Mm -hmm. I got up early one morning, walked around, and said, what is this? It turned out what Buffalo did looked like Hartford. Mm -hmm. So I went to Nina, North Side Institute of Alliance, and said, look it, let's do something on Ashley Street mm -hmm. where I used to live. Mm -hmm. We had 14 designers, garden, landscape designers, to donate their time. Mm -hmm. And they did 14 gardens. That started it. Mm -hmm. the next year, we had the West End involved. Mm -hmm. Then the mayor asked me to do a citywide garden tour, mm -hmm. which we did. This is our second citywide one. Mm -hmm. So it's growing. This, yeah, I really had to see it. The booklet was so many. Mm -hmm. Gardens all over the city. I think even uh, one of the ones that I'm interested in, uh, um, is the sculpture garden at the governor's house. Yes. And, and that's, that's, a, fairly, great, that's yeah. a fairly new garden. So that's part There's of the another one right down the street, Michael Peck's house, mm -hmm. that has a lot of wonderful. I said to him, what about security? He said, don't worry about security. It's all set. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, uh, the West End has some wonderful gardens, but it's not the only neighborhood with a lot of great gardens. They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. People just have to know about them. Mm -hmm. Many of them are public, many of them are private. Mm -hmm. uh, Lynn, the little Jamaican lady there across from Sigourney Market, her backyard looks like Jamaica. You just can't believe what she has in that backyard. She'll grow things in pots and bring them in the house over the winter them and bring them back out. So it's all over the place. Anybody who goes on a tour really will find gems all over the city. I, I want to end on, um, and we want to encourage everybody to go to those tours, and hartfordblooms.org yep. is the place to find out all the details. Um, I want to end on, on a note here, something that, Ron, that you and I talked about, and I'd like you to go into it a little bit, sure. and that is that part of what you try to do with these gardens and with the horticulture in general is to get some of the residents of the city to embrace a more healthy lifestyle. True. Um, there are several ways to, to, to take on urban gardening. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> part of it is to, to empower people to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, through education and outreach. And, and we feel that that's the best way. There are other models where, where uh, you know, there are urban, small urban farms or urban gardeners where, where um, Farmers are hired, mm -hmm. and the food is raised, and it's either sold through a CSA or mm -hmm. the food is given away. Mm -hmm. All wonderful uh, uh, programs. We just feel that the empowerment model is the best way. I mean, the old saying, if you teach a person to fish, mm -hmm. that they eat for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. If you give a person a fish, it's one meal. Right. Um, so by teaching people to garden, we get them outside. Mm -hmm. We get them in the fresh air. Mm -hmm. um, the exercise, it's all part of that embracing a healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. which is uh, what we feel is so important, uh, you know, with what we do as far as gardening. And, and we actually have awards. We, um, we, they used to be called the Hartford Blooms Awards. Mm -hmm. Now we call that the, they call them hugs for short. That's the Hartford Urban Gardening Society Awards, where we feel that residents take on uh, they, they see what the work that we do around the city, mm -hmm. either either with community gardens or with, uh, uh, you know, horticulture, flowers, whatever whatever beautification projects that we undertake. Um, any resident that that takes that those ideas and takes that inspiration and does it in their own yard, we know how much work that is. It's yeah. a lot of work because we do it for, you know, we've been doing it for years and years, and we're going to continue to do it. 
So we realized that, that, that um, hopefully that we were the inspiration for that and someone has taken upon themselves to continue that work. Mm -hmm. We felt that that's uh, a word worthy. So. Well, I think um, ending on beautification of the city and big hugs is the way we should wrap up this program. <laughs> I want to thank all three of you for being with us. It's been really fun having you here today. And thanks for giving us another view of our city and, and another way to look at it. Um, I hope that all of you will uh, tune in for the program on uh, CTN or will go to our website, ct-n.com, and uh, you can watch it on demand there. Thank you so much. And thank you for the great work you guys are doing, really. Pleasure. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you.